Chapter 10. So Arietti told him about borrowing, about how difficult it was and how dangerous. She told him about the storerooms under the floor, about Pod's early exploits, the skills he had shown and the courage. She described those far off days before her birth when Pod and Homily had been rich. She described the musical snuff box of gold filigree and the little bird which flew out of it made of kingfisher feathers how it flapped its wings and sang its song. She described the doll's wardrobe and the tiny green glasses, the little silver teapot out of the drawing room case, the satin bed covers and embroidered sheets. Those we still have, she told him. They're her handkerchiefs. She, the boy realised gradually, was his great aunt Sophie upstairs. He heard how Pod would borrow from her bedroom, picking his way in the firelight among the trinkets on her dressing table, even climbing her bed curtains and walking on her quilt. And of how she would watch him and sometimes talk to him, because, Arietta explained, every day at six o'clock they brought her a decanter of fine old pale Madeira, and how before midnight she would drink the lot. Nobody blamed her, not even Homily, because, as Homily would say, she... Had so few pleasures, poor soul, but Arietta explained after the first three glasses, Great Aunt Sophie never believed in anything she saw. She thinks my father comes after the decanter, said Arietta, and one day when I'm older he's going to take me there and she'll think I come out of the decanter too. It'll please her, my father thinks, as she's used to him now. Once he took my mother and Aunt Sophie perked up like anything and kept asking why my mother didn't come anymore and saying they'd want more to the Madeira because once, she says, she saw a little man and a little woman and now she only sees a little man. I wish she thought I came out of the decanter, said the boy. She gives me dictation and teaches me to write. I only see her in the mornings when she's cross. She stands to me and looks behind my ears and asks Mrs D if I've learned my words. What does Mrs. D look like? asked Arietti. How delicious it was to say Mrs. D. How careless and daring. She's fat and has a moustache and gives me my bath and hurts me with my bruise and my sore elbow and says she'll take a slipper to me if one of these days. The boy pulled up a tuft of grass and stared at it angrily and Arietti saw his lip tremble. My mother's very nice, he said. She lives in India. Why did you lose all your worldly riches? Well, said Arietti, the kitchen boiler burst and hot water came pouring through the floor into our house and everything was washed away and piled up in front of the grating. My father worked night and day, first hot, then cold, trying to salvage things. And there's a dreadful draught in March through that grating. He got ill, you see, and he couldn't borrow. So my uncle Hendreary had to do it, and one or two others, and my mother gave them things bit by bit for all their trouble. But the kingfisher bird was spoiled by the water. All its feathers fell off, and a great twirly spring came jumping out of its side. My father used the spring to keep the door shut against draughts from the grating, and my mother put the feathers in a little moleskin hat. After a while I got born, and my father went borrowing again, but... He gets tired now and he doesn't like curtains, not when any of the bobbles are off. I helped him a bit, said the boy with the teacup. He was shivering all over. I suppose he was frightened. My father frightened, exclaimed Arietti angrily. Frightened of you, she added. Perhaps he doesn't like heights, said the boy. He loves heights said Arietti. The thing he doesn't like is curtains. I've told you, curtains make him tired. The boy sat thoughtfully on his haunches, chewing a blade of grass. Borrowing, he said after a while. Is that what you call it? And what else would you call it? asked Arietti. I'd call it stealing. Arietti laughed. She really laughed. But we are borrowers, she explained. You're a, a human being, or whatever it's called. We're part of the house. You might as well say that the fire grate steals the coal from the coal scuttle. Well, then what is stealing? Arietti looked grave. 
Supposing my uncle Henry borrowed an emerald watch from her dressing table and my, and my father took it and hung it up on our wall. That's stealing. An emerald watch, exclaimed the boy. Well, I just said that because we have one on the wall at home, but my father borrowed it himself. It needn't be a watch. It could be anything, a lump of sugar even, but borrowers don't steal. Except from human beings, said the boy. Ariety burst out laughing. She laughed so much that she had to hide her face in the primrose. Oh dear, she gasped with tears in her eyes. You are funny. She stared upwards at his puzzled face. Human beings are for borrowers, like bread is for butter. The boy was silent a while. A sigh of wind rustled the cherry tree and shivered among the blossoms. Well, I don't believe it, he said at last, watching the falling petals. I don't believe that's what we're for at all, and I don't believe we're dying out. Oh, goodness, exclaimed Arietti impatiently, staring up at his chin. Just use your common sense. You're the only real human being I ever saw. Although I do know of three more, Crampfurl, her and Mrs Driver. But I know lots and lots of borrowers. The overmantles and the heartsy cords and the rain barrels and the linen presses and the boot racks and the Honourable John Studdington's and... He looked down. John Studdington, but he was our grand uncle. Well, this family lived behind a picture, went on Arietti, hardly listening. And there were the stove pipes and the bell pulls and the... Yes, he interrupted, but did you see them? I saw the harpsy cords and my mother was a bell pull. The others were before I was born. He leaned closer. Then where are they now? Tell me that. Well, my uncle Hendreary has a house in the country, said Arietti coldly, edging away from his great lowering face. It was Mr Dover, she noticed, with hairs of palest gold. And five children, harpsichords and clocks. But where are the others? Oh, said Arietti. They're somewhere. But where, she thought. And she shivered slightly in the boy's cold shadow which lay about her, slantwise on the grass. He drew back again, his fair head blocking out a great piece of sky. Well, he said deliberately after a moment, and his eyes were cold. I've only seen two borrowers. And I've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Oh no, whispered Arietti, of human beings, he sat back. Arietti stood very still. She did not look at him. After a while, she said, I don't believe you. All right, he said. Then I'll tell you. I still won't believe you, murmured Arietti. Listen, he said. And he told her about railway stations and football matches and race courses and royal processions and Albert Hall concerts. He told her about India and China and North America and the British Commonwealth. He told her about the July sales. Not hundreds, he said, but thousands and millions and billions and trillions of great, big, enormous people. Now do you believe me? Arietti stared up at him with frightened eyes. He gave her a crick in the neck. I don't know, she whispered. As for you, he went on, leaning closer again. I don't believe that there are any more borrowers anywhere in the world. I believe you're the last three, he said. Arietti dropped her face into the primrose. We're not, as Aunt Lupi and Uncle Henry and all the cousins. I bet they're dead, said the boy. And what's more, he went on, no one will ever believe I've seen you. And you'll be the very last because you're the youngest. One day, he told her, smiling triumphantly. You'll be the only borrower left in the world. He sat still, waiting, but she did not look up. Now you're crying, he remarked after a moment. They're not dead, 
said Arietti in a muffled voice. She was feeling in her little pocket for a handkerchief. They live in a badger set two fields away beyond the spinney. We don't see them because it's too far. There are weasels and things and cows and foxes and crows. Which spinney? he asked. I don't know, Arietti almost shouted. It's along by the gas pipe, a field called Parkins Beck. She blew her nose. I'm going home, she said. Don't go, he said, not yet. Yes, I'm going, said Arietti. His face turned pink. Just let me get the book, he pleaded. I'm not going to read to you now, said Arietti. Why not? She looked at him with angry eyes. Because, listen, he said, I'll go to that field. I'll go and find Uncle Hendreary and the cousins and uh, whatever she is. And if they're alive, I'll tell you. What about that? You could write them a letter and I'll put it down the hole. Arietti gazed up at him. Would you? She breathed. Yeah, I would. Really, I would. Now, can I go and get the book? I'll, I'll go in by the side door. All right, said Arietti absently. Her eyes were shining. When can I give you the letter? Any time, he said, standing above her. Where in the house do you live? Well, began Arietti and stopped. Why once again did she feel this chill? Could it only be his shadow, towering above her, blotting out the sun? I'll put it somewhere, she said hurriedly. I'll put it under the hall mat. Which one? The one by the front door? Yes, yes, that one. He was gone. And she stood there, alone in the sunshine, shoulder deep in the grass. What had happened seemed too big for thought. She felt unable to believe it really had happened. Not only had she been seen, but she had been talked to. Not only had she been talked to, but she had... Arietti! said a voice. She stood up, startled, and spun round. There was Pod, moon-faced, on the path, looking up at her. Come on down, he whispered. She stared at him for a moment as though she did not recognise him. How round his face was, how kind, how familiar. Come on, he said again, more urgently and obediently because he sounded worriedly, worried. She slithered quickly towards him off the bank, balancing her primrose. Put that thing down, he said sharply, when she stood at last beside him on the path. You can't lug great flowers about. You've got a carry bag. What do you want to go up there for? He grumbled as they moved off across the stones. I might never have seen you. Hurry up now, your mother will have tea waiting. <laughs>